Welcome everyone back to our evening service. Start out this. Oh, thou fount of every blessing. Great is thy faithfulness. Singing songs about thanksgiving this evening, thankfulness that we have, that God has done for us. After this, we'll have our opening prayer.
most men, but it's always been a challenge to lead an opening prayer because God is our audience out here and we're the performers. And we certainly don't want to displease our God when we're standing before him. But let us bow together and talk to him just for a few minutes. Our God and our Father in heaven, thank you for the beautiful day you have provided for us. Thank you for the great worship services we had this morning. Thank you for all those who came to participate, to uh, sing songs to your high and holy name, to offer up our prayers, and to listen to a really good sermon this morning about baptism. Thank you for the young lady who responded to the gospel call today. Please, Father, don't Please let us be an encouragement to her and help her in any way that's possible. I know lately that you have blessed this church mightily by several being baptized and added to your kingdom. Father, we don't want to lose anyone because we know that Jesus said he came to seek and save the lost. And as a church, that should be our mission also. There are lost people all around us. And I know the scriptures encourage us to, to speak up for Jesus. To be everything that we can be. And if we don't know how, Father, you know that we can ask for wisdom from you. Because you said all we have to do is ask for it and you will supply it abundantly. But help us to be wise in the way we become servants of yours so that we can reach out and help many others. I ask you to remember those who have had surgery lately, Father. Be with the doctors and those who tend to their needs. We ask for, you know, a good and speedy recovery on their part so that those who have had surgery can, you know, regain their much-wanted health and be back doing the things that they dearly love. May they give you the honor and the glory for, for the things that you have done and helped them with so far. But please continue to bless them. I ask you, Father, to remember those in our congregation. There are several families who are dealing with dementia. It is a horrible disease. And for those of us who have dealt with it in the past, it never gets better. It just seems to get worse. But I ask you to be with the spouses who tend to their wives. Bless them, encourage them, and help them to do everything they can to keep their spouses comfortable and, and you know, enjoy some quality of living. But please continue to watch over and take care of them also. I ask you to be with the elderly in our congregation because we have many that are getting on up there in years, but they are still faithful. They come regularly. They are encouraged, each of us, and that is a precious gift also. But please let us, if they need something, let us be the ones who who go and, and provide for them and take care of them. I ask you to be with the speaker of the hour tonight. I don't know who that is, but I hope and pray, Father, that there's another good message that will be given tonight. May we be encouraged and edified. We ask you, Father, to, uh, to help us grow spiritually. Let us as husbands, Father, be the, the husbands that you want us to be. Let us love our wives and and take care of them and let us be the the godly men that they pr really want and to have and to hold also but please help us in our efforts to be spiritual let us think about godly things let us make christ a priority in our lives every day and i know that if we do that you will certainly bless us immensely but watch over us tonight please be with those who are still sick and and need you know some help or whatever, but please let us be uh, the servants you would have us be in, in providing for their care and, and, and comfort. But be with us as we continue in this worship service. Be with our elders as they guide and direct this flock and be with each of us as we encourage each other by being here in a timely fashion and may the things that we do and say in this building add honor and glory to your, your high and matchless name, for it truly is in Jesus, our, our Savior's name, that we do pray. Amen.
Tonight's scripture will be from Hebrews 1, verses 1 through 3. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the, world of, by the, by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. Give thanks with grateful heart. After this, we'll have our speaker of the hour. I am the speaker of the hour. <laughs> it's good to see each of you here tonight. I uh, hope you got a lot, a lot out of our uh, small group series that we had over the last month or so, uh, but it's good to be back with you on a Sunday evening. I'm glad to have an opportunity to share a message from God's Word with you, and I'm grateful that you've decided to be here tonight. Who is Jesus? That's a question that's been asked for many years now. It certainly was asked throughout Jesus' life and of him. But I'll suggest to you that it's a question that was asked even long before Jesus walked the earth, at least in a sense. Peter tells us in 1 Peter 1, chapter 10 and 11, that the prophets, in a way, asked this question. He says, as to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating, as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. The prophets were told, anxiously anticipated and wondered about the things which the Spirit was indicating to them that were to come. They anticipated who this Christ, the Messiah, would be. And so, of course, when Jesus came and declared to be the Christ, people questioned that. They wondered, who is Jesus? And people are still asking that question today. And I would suggest that everyone here, everyone on earth, has to answer that question in one way or another. It's the ultimate question. It's a question with eternal consequence, eternal implication. We could turn to many places in the Bible to try to answer this question. I, I don't think we can do uh, this question justice, at least not in one lesson. There's a lot to be said about Jesus, a lot to be said about the Christ that the prophets looked for. Uh, but one that's been on my mind recently has been Colossians 1. And so I would invite you to, to turn there. Uh, Colossians 1 uh, is a passage, Colossians 1, 13 and 20 is a passage in which Paul, I think, describes an incomparable Christ. And so we're going to begin reading in verse 13. 
For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Now we're going to come back to these first two verses, but I want for the majority of our time, I want to focus beginning in verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn of the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, and through him to, rec to reconcile all things to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. There's a lot to unpack in those verses. There's several points that I think Paul is making, but I think there's really four major points in these verses that I'd like to discuss with you tonight. The first we have in verse 15, Christ is the image of the invisible God. It's not that God was unknown before Christ, but he was invisible. No man had seen God, could see the face of God, but all of that changed with Christ. Christ fully reveals God. Even, uh, for example, Moses. You know, if there's anyone we think could have seen God, it would be Moses, right? Well, Moses himself asked to see God, to see God's face. If you look over in Exodus 33, this is uh, when the Israelites are at Mount Sinai and Moses has been up uh, on the mount uh, with God, speaking with God, and God is giving the law to Moses. In, in Exodus 33, 18, it says, Moses said, please show me your glory, talking with God. And he that is God said, I myself will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will show compassion to whom I will show compassion. And then he further said, you cannot see my face for mankind shall not see me and live. And so God goes on to tell Moses that he will hide him in the cleft of the rock. And as God passes by, he will cover Moses with his hand. That's where that song lyric comes from that I'm sure many of you have sung before. God's going to cover Moses as he passes by so that Moses cannot see his face, but then he will remove his hand so that Moses can see God's glory from behind. And even just from that glimpse, that incomplete view of God's presence... Moses comes down from the mountain and his face is shining so brightly that the Israelites are afraid and they ask him to put a veil over. And so with Jesus, all of that changes, Paul writes. He gives a face to the invisible God. Through Jesus, we see God's face. I appreciate Sean reading Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 3, I think, uh, says a lot of the same things that Paul is saying here. If you go back to that passage for just a moment, Hebrews 1, uh, Paul, or the, the Hebrew writer, excuse me, uh, makes the point right off the bat that God has made himself known to us. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, he, he's revealed himself throughout time, first to the fathers, so men like Abraham and Jacob and Isaac, then through prophets, men again like, like Moses, uh, all the way through the time of John the Baptist. But in, in verse 2, in these last days... God has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also made the world. So how has God now revealed himself through his Son? And listen to, again what is said in verse 3. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature. And so Jesus is not merely a shadow of God. He is the exact representation of God's glory. And when we look at Jesus' life, that's exactly what he said to be. He said he was. Uh, for example, John 10 and verse 30, he says, I and the Father are one. John 14, 9, when, he, when he's asked to, to show us the Father, he says, the one who has seen me has seen the Father. 
And so God's not unknown. He's revealed himself to us, and ultimately we can see the full image of God in Christ. So that's, I think, the first major point that's made here. He is the image of the invisible God, this Jesus Christ. The second thing, continuing in verse 15, he is the firstborn of all creation, back in Colossians 1. Now, I, you may not expect this, but this, uh, this phrase here has actually caused a lot of uh, divide and debate because of the use of that word firstborn, okay? A lot of, uh, or maybe not a lot, but some groups within the, the broadest sense of Christianity have taken that term firstborn and, and have assigned Jesus a lesser status, They've said he's he's not truly God, he's maybe a lesser God, maybe he's more like an angel, uh, because the idea of firstborn means that it's it's a created being, okay? But that's not what I think is being said here, because we know that with a proper understanding of Scripture that uh, Christ is God, as we just read, uh, I and the Father are one. John 1, 1, John starts his gospel, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was was God. And so this term is not being used, I think, to, to say that Jesus is part of creation, that Jesus is a created being. It's not talking about order of creation or timing or anything like that. Like that. It is a, a designation of supremacy. Jesus is supreme. He's over everything. Going down to verse 18 in Colossians 1, it says that he himself will come to have first place in everything. There's other ways in which this term firstborn is used. This is not the first time we see the idea of firstborn being used regardless of birthplace or time. Uh, Jacob and Esau, for example, you may remember that Jacob was not the firstborn, and yet he was given uh, the firstborn blessing by their father. Ephraim, one of the sons of Joseph, was not the firstborn, but he was given the firstborn blessing. And when Joseph questions that as Jacob's giving this blessing, Jacob says, no, but Ephraim is greater than Manasseh. It was a, a significance of importance and, and reputation, not simply time. But perhaps what's relevant to our passage here, Psalm 89, 26 and 27, God is speaking of David, his anointed king, and he says, he will call to me, you are my father, my God, and my rock of salvation. I will also make him my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. And so David, again, was not the firstborn of his family. He's the youngest of his brothers. He also wasn't the first king that was anointed. And so the term there is clearly used to show importance, the significant position of David as God's anointed king. And it's also believed by many that this is a prophetic a, a passage referring to Jesus. So, so firstborn here is used to show that Christ is above all. And we know that as we keep reading in verse 16, because Paul says that for by him all things were created. Jesus is not simply a part of creation. He is the one through whom all things were created. All of creation, the seen, the unseen, were created through him. And, and Paul il illustrates that clearly because he goes on in great detail about all that has been created through Jesus. Uh, both in heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. Uh, those phrases there uh, were language that the Jews used to refer to different rankings of angels. And so, in so, to some degree, I think Paul's perhaps making the point that Jesus is not just another angel. He's above the angels. He created the angels. The idea that Everything was created by Jesus and God is essential to our faith. It's where the Bible begins. It's where God, again, revealing himself first goes in his scripture. All things were created by God and through Jesus. And we see Jesus early on. He's not mentioned by name, of course, in Genesis 1. But when we look at Genesis 1.26, it doesn't say, let me make mankind in my image. What does it say? Let us make mankind in our image. So we see Jesus right there in the center of creation, and he has authority over all of it. All things are created through Christ, the firstborn of creation, and created for him. 
Then our third point. He is the head of the church. Verse 18. If Jesus is above all of creation, and if he's the center of the gospel, then of course it makes sense that he would be the, the head of the church. And we, we've seen that metaphor, the body used to describe the church. Paul uh, writes elsewhere in 1 Corinthians, for example, uh, about the church being a body and how there are different members. There's feet, there's hands, there's eyes, there's ears, and they're all important, and we wouldn't want to miss any of them. But I think we'd all agree that the head is the most important body part, right? And just as a body cannot survive without a head, the church cannot survive without Christ. And so it's not a preacher, it's not deacons, it's not an elder, it's not a council, it's not a pope that's the head of the church. It is Christ who is head of the church, the ultimate authority in the church. And so as a body looks to the brain, the head, for guidance and direction, so we must look to Jesus Christ as our head in the church. But we're often uh, not that way, right? We want to be head ourselves. At least I think that's how we're prone to think. I, I want to do things my way. I want to do things that are most convenient to me. I want to do things that make sense to me or that make sense in this day and age rather than the way that Christ has set it before us. But Christ has to be the one to direct and guide everything we do as his church. He should be the focal point of our worship, he should be the focal point of our teaching, our preaching, our service, and the way that we live. Finally, verse 19, he's the reconciler. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him and through him to reconcile all things to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven having made peace through the blood of his cross. And although you were previously alienated and hostile in attitude, engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in his body of flesh through death. If you go back to the, to the Garden of Eden, I'm always struck by what seemed to be a very harmonious situation. It, we're, we're told that Adam and Eve could hear God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. I don't know why, but that passage has always stood out to me. But that's, that's the way they lived before sin. Before they sinned and everything changes and all of that came crashing down when sin entered the world and there was this separation that now existed. And the rest of the Bible story is really about God's efforts to bridge that gap, to eliminate that separation. And, and Paul talks about how this all culminates on the cross. How is the reconciliation brought about through the blood of his cross? We've, we've all, I think, experienced separation, divide in relationships to some extent, sometimes very serious, sometimes perhaps less serious where there's a separation, lack of communication, but this goes much deeper than that. Our separation from God meant spiritual death. We're told in Ephesians 2 that we were dead in our trespasses, uh, and only God, through Christ, His Son, and His death could reconcile us. Now go back to verses 13 and 14. Through this reconciliation, I think we see a tremendous benefit, of course, Back to Colossians 1.13. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. As, as now that we're reconciled, we have citizenship. We have a citizenship in God's eternal kingdom. The idea of citizenship would have been extremely important to the, to the person in the first century in Rome. To be a Roman citizen was a huge deal. You might remember Paul, uh, his Roman citizenship is something that enabled him to appeal to Caesar to, to have better legal rights than someone who was not a citizen. Uh, and Christ, by reconciling us, has rescued us from the world and he has transferred us to his kingdom. We're now citizens of his eternal kingdom and the benefits are, are tremendous. Keep reading verse 14, one, that, that primary benefit in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So as citizens, we have forgiveness of sins. We're reconciled because Jesus died, 
and his blood washes our sins. He didn't die for just an elect group. He died for all of us. Now, I don't know about you, when I, when I think about these things, I think I, it gives me pretty lofty thoughts and ideas of who Jesus is. I, ho- I hope it does for you. It does for me. Uh, it, and sometimes I think, you know, why does God care about us? Why, why would God, if he's that way, why would Jesus, if he is above all, if he created all things, why would he care about me? Why would he care about me, especially when, uh, you know, I've been a, as an enemy to him? Jesus is incomparable but he's not unapproachable. Jesus is above all, but he died for all. And so you can be reconciled to him. If you have asked this question, who is Jesus? If you've answered that question and you come to the conclusion that Jesus is this incomparable Christ, he's our savior, he died for us, you can submit yourself to him, you can be buried with him in baptism, as someone did this morning, and as Jody talked about in his lesson, you can have your sins washed away. You can be reconciled to him. You can become a citizen in God's eternal kingdom and receive the, the forgiveness of sins. So if that's you, then it'd be a great thing for us to do that tonight. But perhaps uh, you still need to know more. Perhaps you're just wondering more. Hopefully this has at least stirred your mind, and we'd be more than happy to study this with you to share more about Jesus, this incomparable Christ with you. Maybe you've already done that. Maybe you've already made the decision to be baptized, to be saved, to become uh, one with Christ, and you just realize you've lost sight of this incomparable Christ, and you need our help. Well, then you can also come forward. We can help you with that. You're not alone in, in losing sight at times. I know I do. But if there's any way we can help you today, then we just ask that you come forward as we stand and sing. And we'd like to thank everyone for being out with us this evening. Thank Jared for his message. Um, uh, don't have a lot of other announcements to make. Just pray for those that are, uh, are needing our help. Um, there'll be a lot of people traveling this week, so we need to keep everybody in our prayers as they gather together with family.
We'll have a closing song here, and then, oh, yes, sir. Oh, I'm sorry, yes, the Lord's Supper, if you haven't um, been had the opportunity to take it out, we'll be back in room eight, eight or nine, eight or nine. Okay. Okay. Count your blessings. When upon the hills you are tagless lost, when you are discouraged in your ways lost, count your many blessings in your one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Count your blessings in your one by one, count your blessings in your time. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Blessed are we, Father, for having been able to come here tonight to worship you in truth and in spirit. We ask that you bless each and every one who has come in the name of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and that we may carry that name throughout our days, that we may speak to others in regards to the faith that we have in your Son and in all that you have established for us. Go with us throughout this week, Father, as many from this congregation and around the country are on traveling, doing things for the national holiday of Thanksgiving. May we be thankful, Father, every day of our lives, every moment of every day. May we not just pick one day and think that that's sufficient. You have done so much for us, so many things that we are grateful for, the things that we have for those that we have prayed to you in the past, that you have returned to us, just pleases our heart. Go with us now as we depart from this worship service. May you have been honored and glorified in all that has been said and done in this day. In Christ's name we pray, amen.